It is a huge pleasure to be here with uh, two terrifically good people on the subject of planetary boundaries. Now, um, Felix has brought his great visualization skills to bring the planetary boundaries uh, alive to millions of people around the world. Wonderful work from the Stockholm Resilience Center, which he's about to explain. Then, Vicky Robertson, who is also an EHF fellow, the Piri Piri cohort, um, is... Um, her, her day job is Secretary for the Environment, i.e. Chief Executive for the Ministry for the Environment, uh, and therefore lives and breathes these issues every day. So Vicky will give her perspective on the planetary boundaries for New Zealand. I'm a business journalist. I use the planetary boundaries for many years now as a way of driving home the message that we have to um, embark on this enormous transformation to make sure everything we do works with nature, not against it. Uh, so we give the biosphere, which Felix so beautifully brought to life in his uh, uh, illustrations just now, uh, give the biosphere a chance uh, and all living things in it um, to uh, recover some. We've got just 20 minutes for all that. Uh, the last 10 minutes will be Q&A. There is one microphone over there, so please start queuing in about 10 minutes' time. First, f first one up. First question. So, uh, first of all, Felix is going to give us um, just a five minute um, version of what the planetary boundaries are and why they're so important. A big hand for Felix, please. Thank you. Hi again. So, five minutes will be a challenge. Um, so, what are the planetary boundaries? Well, it comes from, I mean, I've shown this before. This is, it comes from the fact that we entered. Uh, a new epoch, the Anthropocene. Um, you know, we've come to be so impactful in the ways we uh, we build roads, build cities, emit uh, our industries. That we are starting to change, and this is nothing new for you, I guess. We are starting to change heavily the Earth system, and not just climate. Climate is a, a hugely important issue, but there are more. So. Um, this, this came about by what we call the Great Acceleration, when in 1950, after World War II, there was this kind of inflection point where all the human activities and the socio-economic and earth system trends started to you know, become wild. And so we've pushed uh, our activities into a, a kind of a new regime. Uh, which we call the Anthropocene. In, so this is in opposite to the Holocene, which for the last 12,000 years uh, saw the rise of civilization and agriculture, and which we might be calling the long summer or the state of grace for humanity. So we're starting to push outside of this, of this state. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but these are the tipping, the potential tipping elements. So these features or phenomena could change, could tip over to a different regime, and this could, again, uh, become why one of the, the fragile you know, um, points of our planet. So these tipping elements um, can, can switch quite easily, and we're starting to see some of this. Uh, you can see this scenario here in the Paris range is what has been targeted by the Paris Agreement, but you can see that coral reef, Alpine glaciers, Arctic summer sea ice, Greenlands, and the West Antarctic ice sheet are vulnerable, even if we achieve the Paris targets. So we have to do our homework, and this has to be um, quite heavily done. So this weird image here shows a dynamic scape, different attractors, this different basins of stability, um, and you know, we are all living, imagine the planet is part of one of these, be these basins, and if we shake the system, well, we have this resilience, this kind of wall that keeps us into these attractors, these basins of stability, these states. Uh, but there are also critical threshold that we should not, you know, if, if the system becomes too heavily impacted, we can cross over. And this is what is at risk, we might cross to a, cri a critical threshold, a tipping point to a different regime. And so this other graphic shows that in a very geeky way. So in, in 1950, we were at this place and then we've been warming the planet. And now we are at risk of going to a different basin of attraction, which we call the 
hot house earth, which could be a state of warming for millennium to come. So we have to stop before this planetary threshold, which looks also like a shield. And so we have to stabilize the system. And this is by cutting emission as soon as possible. And you know, not just uh, investing in innovation, but to start right away to cut by behavior change, efficiency, and so on. So um, there are different, uh, different aspects or dimensions of the Earth system that are these kind of pillars of stability and resilience. And scientists in Stockholm have identified nine of them, and we call them the planetary boundaries. We should be you know, respecting these pillars uh, to remain on a safe and stable planet. And so this is the framework, the planetary boundaries is about these nine qu quadrants. Uh, you have a safe space where we can uh, keep developing within the, the safe, safe limits. Then there's the risk zone in yellow and the high uncertainty on, or danger zone in red. And so we've identified all those boundaries. So novel entities is pollution, ozone is well known, aerosol, ocean acidification, so you can read. Biosphere and climate change are the two core boundaries, we could say. And this is the current state. So the biodiversity erosion, we've you know, crossed this threshold. This is the sixth extinction, or we're nearing the state of sixth mass extinction. And the biogeochemical flows are also heavily impacted. So nitrogen and uh, phosphorus is you know, messing up with the natural cycles. Ouch. So, and this is through time. So you can see that uh, in 1990, the ozone hole was a big thing, but the Montreal Protocol, you know, we've managed, and this is a great success, we've managed to bring back this boundary within the safe zone. And so we have to do that for all boundaries at global scale, but also at city scale, nation scale, and also household scale. So, and um, yeah, I've done my, my job here. Right. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you, Phyllis. And um, over to you, Vicky. A big hand for Vicky, please. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, so I, I'll come back to the start where we started to this morning. Um, actually, the planetary boundaries framework is just a, a just a tool, and I'll, and we'll talk a bit more about that this afternoon. But what we're about really is. Uh, coming back to old ways of knowing, which uh, effectively is trying to, from the edge, change the way that we think about nature and its place in the hierarchy. So it really is actually trying to make a system change to our economic model. That's what lies behind the intent. Uh, planetary boundaries is just one of a many tools. One of the other tools we want to explore is our own indigenous knowledge and how that comes to environmental well-being. But it's just, uh, you know, there are different ways of coming into this and, and as I think um, somebody said this morning, uh, trying many different ways of doing it. But that's the intent. In the end, trying to look at system change of valuing nature at the top of the hierarchy, not just as another stakeholder, but actually our responsibility back to nature and then making economic decisions that put nature first. So this is a tool to try and um, use international best practice, new ways of uh, thinking about the, the way that our ecosystems actually connect to the world. So rather than New Zealand, in our lovely way, think that we're all fine here, uh, one of the things I've been really shocked in in my own role is just the state of our environment in New Zealand. And I think it's really important that we think about that in respect to the rest of the world. New Zealanders have a really strong identity to our land and we have a grief around our state, where we're at. So we need new ways of having this conversation, is my view. Uh, and I'm willing to try any number of ways of doing that. But the way that going on business as usual is not going to get us there for New Zealand. And I've said that before in this forum. So um, we are exploring, Owen and uh, Felix and I are fellows together, trying to work a way of uh, exploring uh, something that will work for here, uh, and we um, are pretty determined to do that um, in whatever way it works. Uh, the only other thing I would say, um, 
is uh, we really invite your um, interest and uh, we have set up an email account that people can can connect into. Um, not everybody will be part of the project, uh, not everybody will be able to um, engage, but really want to invite your connection because the more people we have that are friends of this, uh, the better. And just keep in mind it's for that bigger purpose, uh, not necessarily just because of the framework of planetary boundaries. Cheers. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just add a little bit more context if I can. Um, of all the nations in the world, uh, we have the highest um, uh, stock of uh, natural resources, natural capital uh, per capita of any country except uh, petroleum exporters. Well, you know where they're going. <laughs> um, so that is the uh, huge target of this land. Um, and as Vicky said, uh, we are degrading, depleting, and stressing that in very fundamental ways. Very interestingly, I'm a business journalist. I take note um, that uh, the business sector here is coming together with government. It's a very big public-private collaboration, sector collaboration. Um, and they've created the Aotearoa Circle, uh, which is focused on bringing natural capital um, into um, all the decisions we make. Um, and so we start to get a much healthier form of capitalism where we start at that point. Um, and so the planetary boundaries work is, is all very much a part of that. The um, little graphic that uh, Felix showed at the end where, this is the rearrangement, uh, thanks to the Stockholm Resilience Centre, uh, who are the drivers of the planetary boundary work, um, of those sustainable development goals, the 17 of them, um, in the most important hierarchy of all, starting with the four at the bottom, the biosphere. And um, if we look at New Zealand's uh, scores on those, they are really poor, uh, particularly life um, underwater and life on the land. Um, and then on top of that, there are the societal ones. Uh, and you can see we have um, some uh, orange ones, which are OK, some red ones, which are not. Yellow's you know, a little better than orange. Um, you can see the direction of travel there for each of those. And then on top of that, uh, naturally would sit the economy nestled in society, and then society nestled um, in the biosphere. Um, and again, we have some good things and some bad things in there. We've got huge work to do, um, but one of the things that worries me the most is the 17th goal in the Sustainable Development Goals is actually about collaboration. That's the peak one there. We are, uh, for a small country, um, surprisingly nowhere near good enough yet at that collaboration. And of course, um, a very important part of uh, our COPAPA in uh, EHF um, is to build that um, collaboration um, at a global scale. Um, so we've got six minutes and 35 seconds and counting down left. I would love to ask these two people wonderful questions, but we'll save that for the workshop this afternoon. But you will have great questions, and there's nobody standing at that microphone. That's a very lonely microphone. <laughs> Is anybody going to rush to it? Thank you, Pagada. So uh, I think where we've landed on that is uh, this particular project around planetary boundaries is not the appropriate one to think about indigenous knowledge. And we need to uh, take a step back. We had a workshop last week. It was pretty clear that uh, the Māori iwi in the room, including uh, Te Atiawa, didn't like the planetary boundaries framework. And uh, we are taking a step back and thinking about uh, a wider conversation about how do you bring motoranga Māori and indigenous knowledge through into environmental reporting and our environmental work programme more generally and not make it part of this process which feels like being shoved into a Western science process. So we have explored that. Um, there is interest and commitment to, to exploring. Basically the intent behind that is to say there are Māori measures that we are using in New Zealand. We use it in our own environmental reporting right now that should have the same hierarchy as Western science. That was the intent. But we need to think about that more broadly than this project. So that's the intention. My response to that is that we, 
do not disagree with the beauty of planetary boundaries. It is the processes and procedures that are being put in place to Whakamuri. So I leave that on the floor. Kia Thank you. Uh, if I just may add to that, um, it's very exciting in the 11 National Sciences Challenges um, to see how profoundly that's shifting with Matarangi Māori, uh, where there is this extraordinary merging and collaboration by scientists. I see it in the one that I'm particularly involved in, in our land and water. Um, and it's um, immensely exciting to see uh, Pākehā scientists uh, really reorient their thinking. There, there, is, there is great work coming out of this. And so that journey that um, Picara and um, uh, Vicky have, have just identified there is a fundamentally important one, not just for us here in Aotearoa, but to, take, uh, to help inform the rest of the world. And um, I have uh, huge confidence that we're going to get there on that. Thanks. A question, thank you. Yeah. Um, Kia ora, folks. Uh, I just wanted to bounce off of all of you. I wanted to check in on how you see us in New Zealand and as a in the wider world working with integrated landscapes. I'm curious what you're, given that integrated landscape approach, um, rather than trying to bite off tiny pieces of the overall puzzle when there's Essentially, when, when you have a complex landscape with a lot of stakeholders involved, um, how essentially you can get everyone to the same table to find cohesive solutions across really large areas. Um, that's worked in places like, uh, like the Kivu province, um, the DRC, in the Kailash sacred landscape dealing with areas of the Himalayas. It's, this is being used by UNEP and WWF and so on. I'm curious where you see the place of that integrated approach working in New Zealand. Uh, you go first, or I'll go first. Um, that's happening very naturally because um, a lot of our environmental legislation is around water catchments. Um, so it's taking um, whole river systems. Um, and what we're seeing within that, particularly, for example, down in Canterbury, is local communities working in their zones uh, within that catchment. Then there are some um, wonderful landscape scale uh, restoration uh, projects at work, uh, in particularly reconnecting Northland, uh, which is moving uh, beyond uh, just pockets of work, but trying to imagine that uh, recovery of all of Northland. Um, again, these are terribly early days, and um, I would long argue that we need um, a next generation of uh, environmental legislation here. The RMA is fine, but um, it wasn't designed for this kind of work. And that's a big discussion that's now underway, led by the Environment Defense Society um, and, uh, and others. So um, this is very much on our minds here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, that we have to work um, at that very large and deeply integrated scale. Um, so I didn't mean to cut off the answer. <laughs> One minute and 15 seconds for a quick question and a short answer. Well, now keep quiet. Um, you know, talking about that legislation, I'm from uh, Whanganui, where the um, iwi and Whanganui have fought an intergenerational fight to, um, to make the river a legal person, which considers it as a whole entity from its source to its uh, to the sea. And um, is that the kind of legislation that you are talking about? Um, that's an, very much on the table because what we're seeing in the Tururueras and the Fonganui River and the Waikato River, uh, where they, there is personhood now and therefore there is legal standing and legal representation uh, for those natural treasures, those natural systems. Yes, uh, it, I would not like to predict whether we're going to get there. Um, but uh, we are one of the pioneers in the world in that sense. And it comes very much from uh, a, a Maori view of life and its sources. Um, and it's notable that it's um, iwi on the Whanganui River, it's tuhoi in the Uruweras uh, that are bringing this to life. So that would be a big thing for us to fight for. Um, we need to stop at that point. A huge thank you for uh, Felix and his astonishing knowledge and great graphic skills. <laughs> um, and to Vicky, who has the hardest job of all because um, she's in the government and trying to change the government at the same time. Um, and do come along to her session 3.30 to 4.30 this afternoon. Kia ora tata. Thank you.